Mike Stern, welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you very much. And um, welcome to Melbourne and Bird's Basement for a whole week. Yeah. Uh, I guess you don't really get to do a residency like this very often. There aren't many places like this. I mean, there's some. There's, um, for instance, a, a, a week at the um, uh, Tokyo Blue Note sometimes, or a few nights anyway. And, uh, and there's some places that you can play for a week at clubs, but you don't get to stay at the, the hotel like where it's right above the place, you know. And, and, uh, and this is special. This is just special. It's really cool. And, and the whole vibe is cool. And the fact that a, a guitar player is, runs the place, you know, was, was, was great news for me. Yeah. And he's a really good cat. Yeah. yeah. Out there, it's really nice. A, a band that you know well, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, is going to be here next week. Wow! Um, and they've had some amazing music, musicians go through that band. Absolutely, uh, including you. What did that band teach you? Well, that was cool for me because I was 22 when I did the, the gig, and I was just going to Berkeley. I was actually had another year at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And, and had another year going there, and then I got that gig, and I got the audition for the gig, and I figured, well, I'll just go and try out for them. You know, they're older cats, and they're playing. I was just kind of more of a blues rocker, but I could play some, some jazz. And I, you know, I used to listen to all kinds of stuff, but, but, uh, but growing up, jazz, it, it kind of, I got really into it when I was about 17 or 18. You know? So I hadn't really played that much, and they were more jazz musicians in that band. So I figured, well, I'll go try out for them, and there was a whole bunch, there was a line of people waiting to get the gig, and I got the gig, and so I went, well, now what am I gonna do, you know? And it was just a really good experience to, to play with them. Jaco Pastorius was in that band, too, for, for a while. He was uh, the great bass player, Jaco, you know, he was, he was, um, uh, Bobby Columbi was doing his record at the time and had just discovered him. And Bobby Columbi was the founding father of Blood, Sweat and Tears and, and a really good drummer. And, and he was producing Jocko's record. And then Ron McClure was the bass player that was playing with, uh, with, with uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears at the time. And he had just left and they had just been there for couple of years and he, he needed to move on and so uh, so Bobby asked Jocko to do it and so Jocko played for about three months during the time I was there. I was there for a couple of years and it was cool. I mean for me it was I was scared and I thought wow you know it's a real band in front of a whole lot of people and all that but it was a, it's a good experience. Yeah. I got uh, my ass kicked needless yeah. to say. Uh, you also played with the great uh, Miles Davis. Yeah I played with Miles. What did Miles ask of you at, at a gig or rehearsal? What, what was well, a lot of times he, Miles used to just, he was kind of a gut level genius, it seemed like to me. He didn't come off with, play this scale or this, sometimes he'd have a couple of specific ideas, but more of it was just a kind of a vague concept, purposely vague. Not, he wanted to see what you would do if he suggested something. How would Miles uh, express his satisfaction or dissatisfaction with what the band was doing? Well, he he was usually pretty cool about it. There were times that he was um, he was kind of uh, not sure himself what he wants to wanted, wanted to do. So sometimes he'd get pissed off as we would be kind of trying to give him what he wanted, and you know he'd tell the bass player, "Okay, play play half notes," and he'd try that for a while, and he asked this and that, you know, from somebody else. And one time he asked the drummer, I was at a rehearsal with him, he asked the drummer, don't you know what I'm looking for? And the drummer said, no, Miles, I really don't. And Miles said, well, neither do I, but I'll let you know when, when we get there. <laughs> you know, that was basically the vibe with him. He was kind of searching. Well, that was cool, though. I mean, it was cool because he would find some stuff. He would, he would, um, try different things, and, and you had to uh, respect him for that, of course. Uh, Miles Davis or not Miles Davis, anybody that's trying to kind of uh, uh, find something with a, with a tune that they're trying to do, a certain kind of concept. 
and and uh, but but uh, there are times when he was a lot easier to get to get along than at other times. There were times that he had a dark side and he'd get pissed off at everybody, you know. Yeah, um, all the great guitarists have their own style, their their own tone. How hard did you work at achieving that yourself, and and what steps did you take? To get there, that just seemed like it to me. It, it seems like um, uh, it's something that that just happens over time if you play enough. And I think everybody's got their own voice. Personally, I mean, it's just sometimes it's harder to. to it's not as obvious in some ways, but but uh, but I, I usually can you know you can hear somebody's the way they do stuff like. It's just everybody's got their own voice. I mean, we, we, you know, the way we talk is, is our way of phrasing. And sometimes it's similar to somebody else, or you get some of this or that. And it's the same with music, you know. Uh, but, but I think um, I, I never really consciously worked at that. But I, I certainly uh, didn't exclude any of the other uh, influences that I, that I uh, have. From from you know, I tried to include them in in, uh, in in what is called jazz. Jazz is a big word; it encompasses a lot. So even when I'm playing more traditional jazz, you know, I'm I'm bending, you know, taking advantage of the fact that I can bend some strings. It sounds more like a horn player to me. And then the other thing I think was uh, a few people are, were doing, and and people still do a lot of guitar players still do are trying to sound like a horn player. So uh, kind of uh, at the time when maybe it was just starting with more effects doing that. I wasn't using a lot of effects. I'm not a big effects guy, but I have a few pedals that I like. And, uh, and, and, and being able to use whatever kind of blues stuff that I have, uh, I, I would try to emulate kind of the feeling of a horn player, kind of more vocal. I'm always trying to get a more vocal sound than a pick kind of sound, although I like both. Sometimes I use two amps and some a little bit of. It's actually a harmonizer effect. It's kind of a chorus sound, but it fattens up the sound, and it makes it sound more, um, to me, more vocal, a little bit more air in the sound. Yeah. That's when you hear a horn, you hear the air, you know, and and uh, and even piano when you when you you hear get the, you know, it's just it resonates a lot. And sometimes a, a guitar right out of an amp sounds a little less like that, and depending on where you're sitting. If you're sitting right in front of it, you don't get that at all. You know, if you sit to kind of the side, it's cool. But I like to try to uh, hear that, you know, in my, in, in my, in the way I pick and also in my, um, the way I kind of use amps and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you use a, a Telecaster usually with uh, a couple of twins or...? Uh, yeah, usually with a couple of twins, but I've been using these Roland amps. Lately, these new Roland amps, they're called uh, Blues Cube amplifiers, and they're really cool, really hip. And uh, I was so amazed, you know, they're digital things, but and usually I'm not a big digital fan. Well, I've, I've had solid state amps, but these are, these, these are smoking, they're, they're really good. Better than the JC120, this amp, the, the Roland JC120 was really a popular amp for for a lot of years. I wasn't crazy about that amp. It was good, but not great. But this uh, this new one is smoking. So I'm actually doing a new record and I'm using those amps, a couple of those amps. But when I'm on the road, I rent uh, Blackface Twins usually. Yeah. Um, you know for using a lot of uh, Boss pedals? I'm using all the all Boss pedals, but I use just a limited amount. I have a, a blues driver and then this other thing I don't even know what it's called. It's a well. It's a it's a, a distortion, not a distortion, but a overdrive. Yeah. Have you been getting yeah. into the new Wasserkraft? No. Pedals? No. Those things scare the hell out of me. I mean, there's so many options, you know. So I try to keep it really kind of simple. I yeah. use this this thing that I talked about. This old thing that no one ever uses anymore. This SBX90 for this one effect. It's a multi effects unit, but I use it for this one effect. I use two amps, I use a little digital delay and a couple of distortion pedals and that's it. Yeah. And then one long delay in case I have this other thing that I like to do from time to time. That's just kind of a weird effect. But, 
but I don't, I'm not a big effects guy. And some people are amazing at it. You know, they can create all kinds of weird stuff and they play their asses off on top of it. I, I just need to focus on just trying to play as good as I can, you know. Yeah. Too many pedals and I'd go nuts. Um, so when you get a call to come down to Melbourne to do a, a gig like this, um, what's your, your first thought about uh, who you're going to play with and, and what material are you going to play? Well, um, uh, uh, usually when, when I get a gig like anywhere, you know, because I'm on the road a lot, I have a, uh, some guys that know my music anyway. Like I, I'll play a lot with the tenor player here, Bob Malik, who's, who's with me, and he's amazing tenor player, but he knows that we've been playing so many times, he's got charts and he's got, you know, tunes that I've written and uh, knows a lot of them. And then Tamor fell the same as the bass player. Will, Will Calhoun, and Tamor's a badass. And Will Calhoun um, is also, as you know, is an amazing drummer. And, and we've been doing less uh, gigs, but we just kind of started playing together, and that's fun as hell. He's, he's wonderful. So, uh, so you, you, and, and there's another opportunity, I guess I should mention, that I have this. Uh, this, uh, there's a club that I've been lucky enough to play in. Well, we just, I started playing there with this friend of mine, Jeff Andrews, who's a great bass player. Years ago, we play, started playing at this little club called the 55 Bar in New York City. And we just kept playing there. And they uh, do it two times a week. And I've been playing there with other cats now, not, not Jeff as much, but, uh, but other people. And, um, and I'm still playing there. So when are we kind of want to rehearse stuff, we get to play live at that place. Yeah. You know? So it's cool. Wayne Krantz plays there a lot. Doesn't Wayne it? plays there a lot. Yeah. But I, I was the me and well, it was actually Jeff that found out about it, and we we played the first gigs that we were playing just duo. Then we started. We were scared. It was in, in this place in a kind of crowded spot in New York in the Village, and we thought, well, maybe it's going to be too loud, so we'll get a drummer. But he played. Brushes and chopsticks, literally chopsticks, and then and gradually he got he pulled out strong, you know, louder sticks, and no one seemed to bitch and moan. So we got, you know, we could play at any dynamic level, basically. So, you know, within reason, it's kind of a small place, but it's a groove to have a place like that where you can play, you know, because there aren't a lot of places like that anymore. Yeah. You know? Um, you also played on a couple of recordings uh, by Melbourne duo, Alex and Melusha. Yeah. How, how did you hook up with those guys? Well, I knew, you know, I've been here a bunch with a, a great cat named Frank Corniola. Yeah. You know Frank, right? Yeah. From He has uh, drum tech, he has a drum shop, and uh, he's brought a whole bunch of people over here. And uh, mainly with, drum, I would come over with Dave Weckl or Dennis Chambers or, you know, different people like that. So um, he introduced me to Alex, and, and then I, I did some uh, uh, recording with him, with both of them, and, and, and it, he's badass. They're both terrific, you know, him and his, and his that gig, that's his wife, of course. Yeah. 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 She's a wonderful singer, and he's, he's a really beautiful percussionist. So. so they asked me to play on some stuff. I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, which guitar have you brought with you? The original Aronson, or you two with the Yamaha version these days? I'm touring with this Yamaha uh, um, uh, guitar. I gave him that Michael Aronson guitar, and Michael Aronson had seen me play with a, uh, Roy Buchanan's old guitar. It was Roy Buchanan, the guitar player. It was a great rocker, you know, and, and, and blues guy from, from around Washington, D.C. area where I grew up. I used to hear him all the time. And then another great guitar player around there, Danny Gatton. And Danny had Roy's, one of Roy's guitars and he needed to sell it. He said, I, I want to buy a used car, so I'm going to sell the guitar for him. So he sold it like for 500 bucks and, and, uh, and it got ripped off, and it, that thing would have been worth a fortune today, but for me it was priceless, because it was a great telly. And, but Michael Aronson had seen me play that guitar, he built one similar to that, so I've been playing that for years. That's at home now, and because Yamaha said they wanted to make a signature guitar, they did such a good job that that's what I'm playing. I'm recording with it, I'm playing with it all the time, and it's, it's, a, it's a good guitar, really good. So it works for me. Yeah. 
Much I was amazed much. they wanted to make a signature guitar. I went, holy shit, really? You're not lying? But yeah, so. Yeah. But growing up and learning the guitar, was there a signature guitar that, that you admired? And did you have anything no. you had? No, I never thought I had one. Hell no. I, didn't, I wasn't sure if I could make this happen. It just kind of happened. I just kept, I wanted to play. I knew I wanted music in my life, but I wasn't sure of how deep it would get, you know. And the more I got into it, the more I, I wanted it to happen. But still, bread-wise, I wasn't sure. Like, I'd probably teach, I figured, you know, and do some local gigs. And then one thing led to another, you know. I never, sure never thought I would play with, uh, well, Blood, Sweat, and Tears or Miles Davis or Billy Cobb or Jocko or Mike Brecker or, you know, all these cats. Or, or Randy Brecker. I'm doing some touring with Randy coming up, and he's playing his ass off, Randy Brecker, an amazing trumpet player, as you know. And he's, I'm trying to get him to, you know, I'm gonna, he, he told me if, when I play here to let him know how the place is. I'm gonna give him a, you know, a rave review, of course. Fantastic. And, um, and so I'm sure he'll be here. Yeah. yeah, your current album is uh, eclectic with Eric Johnson. Have yeah. you got uh, anything coming out soon? Yeah, I have a record that I want to, I'm not sure what to call it, I think I'm going to call it Trip. And, uh, and so, so that's coming out. Um, I'm doing it now. And I've done uh, uh, nine tunes, I have two more to record. And then we got to mix it. And, uh, so it'll probably come out in the fall. And it's on the same label I've been on. It's called Heads Up, which is a part of their affiliate with Concord Records. So they're part of Concord, and Concord's a big record company. So I'm I'm ha happy to have a record, you know, the record label interested, and they're still interested. So so I'm doing this other record. Lenny White's on it, great drummer, and Randy Brecker's going to be on it. And a lot of people that I play with, you know. Um, uh, this tour that I'm doing in the, in the summer is with Randy and Lenny White and, and Tamor Fell, who's, who's playing with me tonight, and he's, he's on the record too. And then Victor Wooten and Dennis Chambers and uh, maybe Will Calhoun, I'm thinking if, if I can, I've got just two more tunes, so I, I, he may play one and Weckl's going to play on another one, so I've got a bunch of cool people yeah. uh, on that. But yeah, I think that's a good title. For, for me, trip. Yeah, it sounds good to me. It's good. It's a really good one for me because recently the re I was supposed to come in in October, and I fell, I tripped, <laughs> bad, and and uh, I fell on some concrete that wasn't supposed to be there in 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 New, in New York City, and but I saw it. And I thought I just misjudged it. You know, I tripped on it, caught my foot, and boy, I fell really bad and broke both my arms. And I have some problems with my hand. This hand, this picking hand, which is on, so everything's on the mend, but it's a nightmare. You know, no, no guitar, that's a guitar player's nightmare, is to hurt his hands or his arms. Or, but, uh, but that's how it happened. So I figured trip, I can't really ignore that that was such a thing for me. So I figured that's, it's a, it, it could mean a lot to a lot of people, but it certainly it's going to be a personal meaning to me. Yeah, yeah we look forward to uh, hearing that. And yeah, thanks. Mike Stern, thanks for your time. Thank you very much.